Tonight I'm going to talk not... I was... I have a science degree and a medical degree and I write books as you might have noticed. Um, I'm not here to speak in any of those capacities. I'm here to speak as a concerned parent. I have four children and some of the things that are going on in this society really concern me very greatly. Um, if they come out with the statement that by 2050 half of us are going to be obese and the other half are going to be overweight then there's something fundamentally wrong in the society and I'm going to try and explain to give you the power to do something about it and that's the purpose of this talk to help you to understand what's actually what are the dynamics the, the biochemical uh, dynamics that are involved and I'm going to make it as simple as possible as jargon free as possible if I do say something that you don't understand, feel free to stop me and ask me to explain it and I'll be happy to do so. But I'll keep it as simple as possible. Um, and I also want you to understand the politics that are going on in behind this, this whole nutritional debate, if you like. Um, I spent many years working in Africa and for the most part you're dealing with nutritional deficiencies in Africa and you're dealing with, in some cases, starvation. And then in 2002 I came back to the UK. I was based in, the, in West Sussex at the time and I was shocked, really, really shocked by how many overweight adults and how many overweight children. And that's one of the purposes, that's what triggered that book, that good food book, because I wanted to know something had gone fundamentally wrong in Western society since I left and when I came back I saw something I didn't really understand. So the purpose of this talk is to try and explain some of the nutritional issues that are being debated in the society at the present point in time. Again, if there's something that you want me to stop or explain or whatever, feel free to do so. Now, just before we start, I need a few volunteers. So I know, Pradeep, you're always good at volunteering, and I know, Hallie, you love to volunteer as well. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at a future point, I'm going to ask you if you could volunteer. I need three volunteers. So any, anybody else like to volunteer? Okay, so we have three volunteers. It's just to explain something to you uh, in as simple a language as I can, and it's easy just to demonstrate with people. Okay. Now, um, Conflicts of interest at the bottom of that slide. This is a really critical area and any speaker that speaks to you, the first thing I would say is don't trust anything that anybody has to say, including me, unless you're actually satisfied that it sits right with you and you have researched it enough to the point where you're comfortable to accept the truth, that truth. Um, the reason why I say that is because there's a lot, uh, at the core of a lot of nutritional issues in Western society are conflicts of interest. And I'm going to go into that in a wee bit detail. So, when you're reading a research article on nutrition, <coughs> the first thing that I look at is who has sponsored it, who has paid for it. And if it's public money, like the NIH in the United States, the National Institute for Health in the United States, well, I'll read the article. If it's sponsored by a private company like Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, then I'm not going to read the article, no matter how interesting it seems. Uh, because there's a lot of misinformation being directed at people as well. Okay, so that's the purpose of that sli slide. Um, now, one of the things that has surprised me is that um, I do a little bit of work. Um, I retired a couple of years ago because of health problems. I picked up a little virus in Africa. A little virus is nothing more than a little bit of DNA, a little bit of genetic material with a protein coat. Yet it wreaks havoc in people. And it wreaked havoc in me to some extent. And I'm, I'm a lot stronger now, so I'm see seeing a few patients. And these are some of the patients that I've seen. Um, a six-year-old boy with frequent bouts of diarrhea um, that's not uncommon in Africa, but it's, it's less common here. Um, James was a 29-year-old pilot. He flew for, he was a pilot with Ryanair, the world's favorite airline. Um, a bit difficult if you have diarrhea problems 
and you're flying a flight, a long flight in particular. Well, Ryanair don't really fly long flights, do they? They tend to fly short flights. Um, Ronan, a 16-year-old boy at school in Northern Ireland, um, had to leave school because in some occasions he didn't get to the toilet in time. That's, ter that's extremely embarrassing for a young teenager. And he quit school, basically, and came to see me and was desperate. And if I had told him to eat grass and stones, he would have done so. Um, he was that desperate. Um, Anya, a 20-year-old, a number of 20-year-olds actually, I'll just put Anya in there, but there were a number of 20-year-olds who came to me with similar kind of symptoms. A bloating, wind, um, diarrhea being the predominant symptoms. And none of them had blood or mucus in the stool. All of them had been investigated via their GP with the gastroenterologist. And all the investigations were normal. I do gut function tests on people, as you probably know, from the heart to stomach book. And all of them showed up as having inflammation in the small intestine. And the other word for that is leaky gut syndrome. The minute they went off gluten is the minute their symptoms abated. Now, that's too much, too many people, too many patients over a very young age group of people. Um, and I was just seeing one case after the next, after the next, after the next. And this has to do with wheat. This has to do with what they have done with wheat. Um, they haven't genetically modified it, although there is genetic modif mod modified wheat, I think in India. In, uh, Monsanto has an affiliate in India. And I think India is the only country at this stage that actually grows, commer for commercial purposes, that grows genetically modified wheat. If I use the word genetic modification and genetic manipulation, should I explain those two things? Genetic modification is where you take a gene from a bacterium or a virus or whatever, another species, and you inject it into the plant. So you've altered the genetic composition. That's genetic modification. You've heard of GMO or genetically modified soya in particular. <coughs> genetic manipulation means hybridization where you cross one species of wheat with another species of wheat and you end up with a new plant. And you keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that. And 95% of the genome or 95% of the DNA is maintained and there's a 5% that is new for the next generation, for the, when, you, when you breed the two of them, the next generation will have a 5% change. But if you do that repeatedly, generation after generation after generation, you're going to end up with quite a different plant. And I'm going to talk about that in a few moments. Um, this r refers to my own family, to my daughter. And children being children, they never listen to their parents. So she ended up with certain problems. She had skin problems. She had a rash on her skin. Um, she started to get tummy problems, cramps in her tummy, and started to feel lethargic. And I suggested that we do a gut function test with her. No, 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 that's nonsense. She said, went to her GP. This is, she lives in England. Um, GP discovered she was anemic as well and put her on iron tablets. And she thought that solved the problem. Then the problem got worse and she woke up in the middle of the night with gripping pains in her tummy where she couldn't sleep at night and eventually listened to father and decided she would experiment with gluten just to see. And lo and behold, again, her symptoms disappeared. Now she pays a bit more attention, not much, but a bit more attention to what I say. The reason for this is my own experience as well. When I was growing, I grew up in the countryside in Northern Ireland, and wheat was this high off the ground. It was a tall plant, it used to wave magically in the wind. The, the wheat, I now live in County Wexford, and I can see the wheat that they're growing. 99% of the wheat, the commercial wheat that's grown in the world today, is what they call dwarf wheat. It's this high off the ground. It's about a foot off the ground. That's visually a massive change in the plant. And the reason for that change is because the head of the plant is where all the starch is. It's about 70% starch. Wheat is about 70% starch and about 10 to 15% protein. 
Now what they've done is they've increased the, the yield on this plant. So you're getting like 10, almost 10 times the yield compared to the wheat that I grew up with. Um, so the starch content has increased massively. The protein content, and it's always the protein content that causes the difficulties in people, it's the gluten content in other words, that has increased massively. And as a consequence, the head of the plant is too heavy. So if you have a long stalk, it falls over and the farmer has difficulty harvesting it. So what they did was they worked and worked and worked on trying to find a stronger stalk and a shorter stalk. And the guy who designed this stalk or genetically modif manipulated the plant to get a shorter stalk won the Nobel Prize for it and won the Gold Congressional Medal in the United States and was praised all over the world as... And he, he deservedly, he deserves his accolades because he did an amazing thing, really. Um, if you get up to ten times more yield from a plant, then it means you can feed more people. So I'm not arguing with the chap and I'm not arguing with his agenda. He did a wonderful job. Unfortunately, this was all done without doing any human trials on wheat. And today we have an epidemic, like the cases I've just described, and there's many, many more of them. Cases of people who could have tolerated the old wheat, like me, and can't tolerate the modern wheat. And the reason is the gluten content is too high. And it's the agriculturalists and some of the doctors who have come to this conclusion that um, it's actually affecting people adversely and people just forgot to do trials. Um, gluten is an irritant, particularly for the Celtic races of people. Um, if you're Celtic, you're more likely to have a, a problem with gluten, either celiac disease or you're more likely to have gluten intolerance or gluten sensitivity, if you like. But um, all of these disorders, gluten intolerance and celiac disease, like celiac disease has, has increased fourfold in my lifetime. That's an incredible... Uh, and only 10% of celiacs are ever diagnosed. So that's a phenomenal increase. Um, people often look at wheat and say, oh, it's the gluten that's causing the problem. As you're going to see in a moment, the starch is also causing a problem. Because the starch, well, if you look on your computer, when you get home, go into Google, the world's famous library. Go into Google, type in glycemic index. Glycemic index is how high a food will raise your blood sugar level. Um, wheat, including whole wheat, has a number 72 attached to it. Sucrose, or table sugar, has a number of 59 attached to it. So wheat raises your blood sugar level higher than, than sugar. Now that's an extraordinary thing. And of itself doesn't mean a whole lot. But as you're going to see in a moment, in the context of the foods that we're eating in a, in a moment, you'll see that it, does, it is playing a critical role in the whole equation. Because you're being advised by your government to eat more wheat eat more starch, and the main starch in Western society is obviously wheat. Okay. Now one point that I want, I'll repeat it again and again and again. Um, starch is a long chain of glucose molecules. So starch is really glucose. So wheat is mostly glucose. So when you eat wheat, your blood sugar level goes up. The body's response, the body doesn't like too high or too low. The body likes balances. So the pancreas pumps out insulin to bring your blood sugar level down. The unfortunate thing about insulin is, well, insulin is a bit like an usher, ushering you to your seat in the cinema or whatever. We didn't have an usher here tonight, sorry. <laughs> but 
Uh, insulin is a bit like a, uh, a doorkeeper or an usher or whatever. It ushers glucose out of the bloodstream, but unfortunately it ushers everything else out of the bloodstream at the same time. It ushers fat out of the bloodstream into the cells, and it ushers amino acids for protein out of the bloodstream into the cells. So when it's ushering glucose out, it ushers everything else out. And that's significant when we come to talk about obesity later on. With this new wheat, the farmers are very happy because it's a short wheat, the dwarf wheat is easy to harvest. Um, the seed producers are obviously very happy. Um, the chemical companies are delighted, particularly Monsanto, because they've now got a brand of wheat that is Roundup. You know there's the weed killer Roundup? You've heard of Roundup? Um, they've, got a, they've genetically manipulated the plant where it tolerates Roundup. So they can you can spray as much Roundup as you like on the plant. And chemical companies love that because it's more profit, obviously. Politicians are very happy because people uh, have more and more food. And the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and the European Food Safety Authority, also very happy. So we're all happy. <laughs> However, celiac patients are definitely not happy. The patients I just mentioned a moment ago are also not happy. IBS patients not happy. Overweight patients are bearing the brunt of this new wheat. Um, many doctors like Dr. Murray in the Mayo Clinic also not happy and he puts it down to agriculture, the agricultural changes that have taken place in, in my lifetime. A lady asked me at a talk once, uh, when was I born? So being vague I said after the war <laughs> and she said which war? The First World War, the Second World War. <laughs> Mm. <coughs> if you're interested, I'm trying to t keep this talk as non-academic as possible, it's for the general public, but if I know there's some of you from nutritional colleges here. Um, the work of Dr. Fasano is particularly interesting. Alessio Fasano is in the University of Maryland. He's done a lot of work with wh why gluten is an irritant in the gut why it stimulates inflammation in the gut and why it triggers the immune system to do what it does. Um, he's also done work with autism. Now I used to treat a lot of autistic children and I'm not left in any doubt about the effect of gluten on autistic children. Um, gluten basically is, the protein is broken down in the stomach to peptides. Peptides are, are smaller proteins and the peptides are supposed to be broken down to amino acids in the small intestine, but instead what happens in, with autistic children is they leak across the gut wall, head straight for the brain, attach to morphine receptors, uh, receptors, opiate receptors in the brain, and disturbs brain chemistry. Now that pathway is partly due to this man, but it has been well worked out in the University of Sunderland as well in the UK. Um, a very obvious link with leaky gut, as I described in the case histories that I mentioned earlier. Those are just some other cases. Um, some people don't realize they have celiac disease. Um, sometimes they have no symptoms. Sometimes they just have a skin rash. Sometimes they just have fatigue. So it's really because, mo I presume most of you are Irish, this is Dublin, isn't it? Yes, yes yeah, good. Just checking. Um, that it's worth, worth your while. You don't have to. The old way of, of diagnosing celiac disease was they pass down a scope, a gastroscope, take a biopsy of the small intestine, send it to the lab, and if the villi, which are my fingers, are flattened like that, then that's celiac disease. You can, there are two blood tests that can be done. So um, if you want to get it done, it would be an advisable thing. Next time you go to your GP, ask for a TTG. TTG is tissue transglutaminase antibodies. Tissue transglutaminase, TTG. Um, that's one of the blood tests that can be done. And it's an, it's an easy thing. And if it's positive, then avoid gluten, please. 
but you're probably going to avoid gluten by the end of this talk, so <laughs> you'll have nothing left to eat by the end of this talk. In fact, I, any talk that I ever give in the future, I'd be wary sitting in the front seat. Um, because people say that if you, if you sit close, in, close to me for long enough, you'll be put on a diet. Um, so better, better you sit back a little bit in future. Okay. Sorry, when you say that you do spelt, it It doesn't apply to spelt, no. Spelt has a tiny amount of gluten compared to wheat. The, the amount of wheat, the amount of gluten in wheat is phenomenal. To d in modern wheat I'm talking about, not, not the old wheat. The most high celebrity kiss that had a problem with gluten was Novak Djokovic. Um, my son was training to be a professional tennis player in Spain. I, I knew a lot of the Spanish tennis players and I knew some of the professionals. And I knew the story with Novak Djokovic because Juan Carlos Ferrero used to play with him and was friends with him. So I know this story because of Juan Carlos. Um, that Novak Djokovic was very obviously, I don't know if, you're, if you've ever watched him play tennis in the old days, like a couple of years ago. He was out of breath. He was doing this all the time, finding it difficult to catch his breath. And eventually he decided, he, he went to his doctor. He was number three in the world at the time. And went to his doctor and his doctor <coughs> did tests on him and decided, I'm taking gluten out of the diet. Within months of doing so, his game improved tremendously and he became number one in the world. And he attributes it, I, I know personally that he attributes it himself to the removal of gluten. And as, as a consequence, Rafael Nadal, uh, Al, uh, Murray, what's his first name? Andy. No? Andy. Andy Murray, thank you. Just got a blank there for a minute. <laughs> um, Andy Murray, all the top tennis players have done likewise. Um, and that has to do with modern wheat as well. So just to, to say that now, my volunteers, I'm going to now stop talking about wheat and I'm now going to talk about sugar. So if anybody has a quick question, if they want to ask a question about wheat, I will come back to it in a moment. Well, I'm actually going to come back to it now. Um, yeah, but it's something specific you want to ask, yeah? Uh, when you spelt, just shout, please. Yeah? Is the gluten content in spelt insignificant? So would, would a celiac, for instance, get to tolerate spelt? I wouldn't give it to a celiac because celiac is a disease you must take very seriously. Um, celiacs end up being malnourished. Uh, they can't absorb correctly. And they be, end up being seriously malnourished and they're at risk of cancer. So I wouldn't play around with celiac disease. I wouldn't give them any gluten whatsoever. And I'd be very, very strict about that, about cooking utensils and work <coughs> surfaces and so on. If it's just um, minor symptoms associated with gluten sensitivity, then I, I, I would say spelt is fine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, what about oats? Oats doesn't have gluten. In the old days, we used to say to people, stay away from wheat, rye, oats and barley because the manufacturers of oats are also the manufacturer of those other cereals. So there's cross-contamination. So we used to say to people, avoid oats as well. But you can now get gluten-free oats. You can get oats that is certified that it hasn't been contaminated with gluten. And celiacs should be able to tolerate that. In fact, the Celiac Society recommend oats. So it should be fine. OK, now, a bit of fun. Um, I need my three volunteers, please. Actually, we'll come over here. Um, oh, you're a volunteer, Hallie. I forgot. Yeah. Um, you're wheat, Hallie. Okay. You're fructose. Okay. And you're glucose. Okay, so if you can. Can you see that, everybody? Just yeah. Can glucose and fructose come together? Not two together, no, not too close, but... <laughs> <laughs> and wheat, just a wee bit further away. Thank you, wheat. Now, the purpose of this exercise is... Sorry? Sorry? Oh, need the mic, thank you. Okay. Um, the purpose of this exercise is to show you what's happening in the body. Sucrose or table sugar, I'll use the word sugar, just, 
I'll use the word sugar, and when I use the word sugar, I actually mean sucrose or table sugar. Okay? Table sugar is made up of two sugars, a bit like Laurel and Hardy, one's no good without the other. Um, so the two sugars are fructose and glucose. And when you swallow your sugar, your daily intake of lots of sugar, the body splits the two sugars and they separate. Thank you. They've nicely separated. Now, um, if we take... There's a bit of feedback on this. Um, if we take the front row, let's take this front row as the liver, and the next row as another organ, the heart, and the next org organ, the brain, or whatever, whatever. So the rest of you are all cells in the body. And this front row here is the liver. Glucose can go to any cell in the body and will be utilized as energy. And it's an important source of energy. If you want a quick fix, you want a quick bit of energy, eat glucose. It will supply the body with energy. And it's nature's way of providing you with energy. Nothing wrong with that. Glucose, a good chap. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> Fructose, on the other hand, sorry to do this to you, <laughs> but I have no choice. Um, fructose in the okay, fructose in the equation is the bad guy. So sorry to label you the bad guy. Um, fructose goes to the liver; it doesn't really go to the rest of the body. And when fructose goes to the liver, it has a pretty similar effect to alcohol. It's metabolized to fat. Not all of it, but most of it will be metabolized to fat. Via a nice equation for those of you academically inclined, it's a nice simple word. It's called de novo lipogenesis. That's nice and simple. I'm sure you all understand that completely. But it means new formation of fat. That's really what it means. And that's what, that's what happens when you take fructose. Fructose in small amounts, no problem. Fructose in fruit, fructose in fruit, okay. Fructose in honey, okay. Fructose, wherever, it's okay. No big deal. A wee bit of table sugar, no problem either. Now, when fructose and glucose are combined, if you take glucose by itself, there's no problem with the body. The body handles it very well. It's metabolized, burnt off, you get energy. End of story. When it links up with fructose, you're in a bit of trouble. Because glucose facilitates the damage that fructose does in the body. And this is a point that is being missed by everybody virtually. Um, glucose does certain things. It facilitates the absorption of fructose in the gut. That's the first mistake that glucose makes. The second thing that it does is, we said a moment ago that glucose will raise insulin levels. So glucose will raise insulin levels, but fructose doesn't raise, fructose doesn't affect insulin at all. So if you make fat here, and you also raise insulin levels, that insulin is going to push the fat into the cells of the body. And that's, that's the error that happens in obesity and overweight that you're pushing too much fat into the cells, the cells become dysfunctional, and then you develop, then you develop what's called insulin resistance. But I'll explain that in a moment. So where does wheat come into this equation? The reason why I'm showing you wheat at the same time is wheat is a long chain of glucose molecules. The starch in, in wheat is a long chain of glucose molecules. And it's a particular form of starch that is easily absorbed and quickly absorbed. Now, if you absorb a lot of glucose, you're going to pump the insulin level up, 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 and all the fat that you make is virtually going to be stored. And we're going to come back to this again and again and again because this is an equation. The government is basically advising you to eat lots of wheat. At the bottom of the food pyramid is carbohydrates. Eat many servings a day, it depends on which food pyramid you look at, but 8 to 10 servings a day, that's a lot. When you look at people's food baskets, when I came back to England, 
I was looking at people's shopping trolleys. People don't like me looking in their shopping trolleys. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all pizza, pasta, pies, anything beginning with P, <laughs> including bread. Bread is also just a P upside down. Um, starchy stuff is being consumed in large quantities because you're being told to take starch. It's good. Well, it's not so good. The truth is that it's actually causing a lot of harm. Okay, so thank you very much, volunteers, for that. Thank you. Thank you. You got a round of applause then. Where's my little thing gone? Okay, so glucose is harmless, fructose is harmful. I was taught this. I went to university in Dublin here. I knew this in the early 70s. We were taught this. When we did biochemistry, we were taught that fructose is lipogenic, which means it produces fat in the body. It produces lipids or fats. So it isn't like we didn't know. And the reason why we were taught that is because a professor in England, a professor in the University of London called John Yudkin, um, wrote a marvellous book. It's called Pure White and Deadly. And he did a massive amount of research on fructose and glucose. And at the end of the book actually calls for a ban on fructose. Today we have doctors announcing that fructose is poison, that it should be labelled by the FDA and the FSA as a poison. In small quantities, not a problem. But something happened in the United States in the mid-70s. All our problems, let's blame them on the United States. That, 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 that eases our mind somewhat. And let's blame it on President Nixon because all bad things that happen in the United States have to do with President Nixon. But that's actually what happened. President Nixon in 1974 wanted to produce cheap food, as cheap as possible. And he told food chemists, he, he called them together and asked them to put their brains together to find out how to do this. And they decided to remove fat or replace most of the fat in food with sugar, but a particular sugar <coughs> called high fructose sugar. Proper name for it is high fructose corn syrup. And it's labelled, you'll see it on labels as fructose glucose, or it's labelled as corn syrup, or it's labelled as high fructose corn syrup, or if, if they want to be really clever, they label it as inverted sugar. Now that was dangerous, because once you up the fructose content of the diet, and all McDonald's hamburgers, all McDonald's hot dogs, all McDonald's everything virtually, except the tea and the coffee and the, maybe the chicken nuggets, have uh, high fructose corn syrup in it. Even some gluten-free products, I'm going to show you one in a moment, has high fructose corn syrup in it as well. So you've really got to read labels and avoid this stuff as much as you possibly can. Just to reinforce it again, glucose leads to insulin raises insulin levels in the bloodstream. Insulin pushes glucose into the cells, but it also pushes fat into cells. So if you up the blood glucose level with lots and lots and lots of starch, you're encouraging the de deposition of fat, more and more fat, provided you've eaten sugar at the same time, provided you've eaten some fructose at the same time, you're going to make sure that fat is deposited in organs. And once you're deposited in organs, that's the, where the problems start. So if you see the word insulin, you must know it stores fat. Thank you. And that's President Nixon. He reduced fat, increased sugar, obesity crisis began, and the food pyramid, the, the USDA, the, um, the Department of Agriculture in the United States, had decided to produce a food pyramid, as if we didn't know what to eat. They decided to tell us what to eat. And the USDA is the Department of Agriculture. It's not a health body, it's, it represents farmers. It represents food producers in the United States. So why is somebody who's representing food producers telling us what to eat? That's, that's not right. That, that should be the Surgeon General's office or 
the FSA in this country or somebody like that telling us maybe what to eat. But I don't believe in telling people what to eat. My mother wasn't told what to eat. My grandmother wasn't told what to eat and I wasn't told what to eat. People somehow knew what to eat. Um, experiments with fructose that John Yud con conducted on a, a number of species of animal and in a number of impoverished students at the University of London also got tested as well and discovered certain things about it that the effects are very similar to alcohol. Obviously they don't have the brain effects, the staggering gait and the slurred speech and all of that because alcohol does affect your central nervous system. Obviously fructose doesn't do that but fructose has a lot of the other effects. The beer belly, the deposition of fat in the liver, the deposition of fat in other organs and so on. Um, fructose will very quickly deplete your energy. Nature did not intend you to eat much fructose. So there's no controls on the pathway where fructose is broken down. And it, if I still use the word ATP, do you know what I'm talking about? ATP is stored energy. And your stored energy gets depleted and depleted and depleted the more and more fructose you use. Whereas with glucose, for example, glucose also depletes your energy level. But there's checks and balances <coughs> on that glucose pathway, if that's not being too uh, obscure or difficult. He discovered, John Yudkin discovered, long before we ever heard the term metabolic syndrome, which a lot of overweight patients suffer from. Um, John Yudkin described it back in the 50s and the 60s. And he also suggested that fructose can generate the production of oestrogen in the body and lead to oestrogen cancers. Oestrogen cancers are breast cancer and endometrial cancer. And that's really sugar in a nutshell. Now, the level of sugar in the diet is frighteningly high. And the government's response is put a tax on it. Um, that, that, that to me doesn't make sense. Um, the, the reason I'll explain in a moment. But really, to me, the, what Coca-Cola have done is actually a good thing. Coca-Cola were advised by the top investors in the world to reduce their level of sugar and to substitute, it, to substitute with stevia, which they have done. But that was at the behest of investors, not at the behest of governments or WHO or anybody else, because the food manufacturers don't listen to these bodies. They don't have to. Um, but they do listen to investors. By the way, when I mention companies like Coca-Cola or Kellogg's or Mars or whatever, I'm not doing so in a critical manner. I'm not here to criticize anybody. I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm not here to do anybody any harm. And keep that in mind. Although I have to mention some companies, I mean them no harm. There's no discredit. I'm trying not to build up any bad karma for, for my future lives, <laughs> if I do happen to have future lives. And I'm trying to keep my head on my shoulders in this life. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, we're now going to talk a wee bit about sugar, sugar substitutes, because sugar became a big issue in the 1980s. And suddenly, there was the development of a lot of sugar substitutes, artificial sweeteners, they're called. Um, so we had diet drinks and things like this fellow here, Coca-Cola Zero. Wonderful product, this. <laughs> Um, and everybody thought this is wonderful, zero calories, we can now drink, 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 drink merrily and there's no guilt. We don't have to worry about sugar, we don't have to worry about putting on weight. It's, it strikes me as strange that my mother knew what, that sugar will increase the pounds. My grandmother knew it, my sisters knew it, everybody knew it, it was common knowledge. But somehow or other, the sugar content of the diet kept increasing and increasing and increasing and has reached alarming proportions today. And the FSA and the EFS, the European FSA and the FDA in the United States, although they are advising now at this point in time, many years later, 40 years into the obesity epidemic, 
that we should cut down on sugar, but they're saying nothing about starch. Um, but anyway, we thought this was a big step forward. Then research was done in the 1990s and in the early 2000s in Italy, in a cancer research centre in Italy by a couple of Italians. And they discovered that it was the first study where they actually looked at the effect of aspartame. Aspartame is an artificial sweetener. The effect on the lifetime of a rat. Most of the studies that had been done had been done over a couple of weeks. So they weren't long-term studies. This was the first time that long-term studies were done on experimental animals. And they discovered that it, there was an increased risk of blood cancers, that's leukemia and lymphoma and multiple myeloma, in these animals. As a consequence, there was a long-term human study done. And the results of that came out at the end of 2012 in Harvard Medical School in the United States. And the lead researcher, Dr. Schoenhammer, was alarmed by what she saw, by the results, when, when they were finally tabulated. And she set up an interview with one of the television stations. I've forgotten which television station it was. I think it was ABC or maybe NBC. And there was another doctor supposed to speak as well. The problem was that Harvard Medical School is sponsored by Coca-Cola, by Pepsi-Cola, by the major food companies. And quickly, the interview was pulled. And her words, her words for the description of the research changed dramatically to say this could be just due to chance. Now that's sad because that study was funded by public money by the NIH, the National Institutes for Health. And it was a long-term study. It was done over 20 years. And it involved, I think, 49,000 men and 77,000 women. That's a lot of people. So it was a wonderful study, really a fantastically designed study. And it showed that there was indeed a risk associated with blood cancers. Now, it isn't that we didn't know this. Because back in the mid-70s, when the FDA got an application from the company that make a spark team. The company was called G G G D Searle, S-E-A-R-L-E, G D Searle, a pharmaceutical company in Chicago. The CEO of G D Searle was Donald Rumsfeld at the time. You know Donald Rumsfeld from his <coughs> tours in the US administration. Donald Rumsfeld was good friends with Ronald Reagan. Um, he wanted this approved. Three times the FDA refused to approve it because of the cancer risk. That was the basis for the refusal. But the FDA did something else. In addition to refusing it, they actually referred the company to the Attorney General's Office for Scientific Fraud because they had manipulated the data to give it a good, a good picture, if you like, or a, a better chance of approval. Now that's a serious accusation against a company that's producing a, a, a chemical that's going to be added into the food chain. In 1980, Ronald Reagan came to power. His, one of his first maneuvers as, a as the US president was to fire the FDA commissioner. Put a man in by the name of Dr. Hayes and Dr. Hayes quickly approved a spark team for use in liquids. Today aspartame is in many vitamins, it's in LEMSIP, it's in over-the-counter medicines, it's in many like calcium, um, fibrogel, it's in many medications, it's in many vitamin tablets, it's in many drinks, it's in many foods. And you're consuming it thinking that it's safe. And I've asked the EFSA many, many times, and I keep getting the same answer, we're reviewing it, is the inevitable refrain that I hear from the Irish FSA and the European FSA in Brussels. That's simply not good enough. You're not being protected, and I'm going to explain why you're not being protected in a moment. 
A spark tim, interestingly, also has an effect on pilots. If pilots don't eat food, a lot of pilots are rushing, and they'll grab a soft drink like Coca-Cola Zero and a packet of crisps or something before the flight. They've discovered that it interferes with their vision, and it's now recommended that all pilots avoid anything with a spark tim in it. So various scandals. The President Nixon scandal of taking fat out of food why would you want to take fat out of food? Well, the reason was there was a suspicion that it was implicated in heart disease. Now, if you think about that a little bit logically for a moment, you don't need to be a scientist, you don't need to be a doctor to understand that fat couldn't possibly be implicated in heart disease. If you imagine the year 1900, heart disease was rare. And interestingly, we have a group of cardiologists next door. I think, Hallie, you should escort them in here. <laughs> But um, they might be dismayed at what I have to say, and probably would be dismayed at what I have to say, but um, in the year 1900, very little heart disease. By the 1950s, it was an epidemic. Animal fat decreased during rationing in the Second World War, during the Second World War and after the Second World War. Animal fat was rare, um, unless you were a farmer. So it couldn't possibly be implicated in heart disease. But what did increase in the diet was sugar. White flour and sugar, the two deadly poisons in Western society. And if any of you are involved with nutrition or learning nutrition, there's a book you really have to read. And for the general public as well, it's a, it's a good book to read. If you want to be convinced about the damage that Western foods do to people, there's a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. She's your secretary, is she? <laughs> um, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. Weston A. Price, Dr. Price was a dentist in the early part of the 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, in somewhere in the United States, in Cleveland, Ohio, that's where it was. And he was so worried that so many people were showing up with dental decay that he wanted to know why. What is it in the Western diet that's actually causing the problem? And he did a fantastic bit of research, which really should be duplicated today by some innovative soul. His nephew worked for National Geographic, so he knew where to find isolated communities and he wanted to find the most isolated communities on the planet to see what they were eating, to measure the level of dental decay, to measure the uh, uh, dental arch and to check for TB because TB was rampant at that time. Um, he went to the high valleys in the Swiss Alps. He went to the uh, Outer Hebrides, he went all over the place basically to the remote, most remote communities and discovered that in the high valleys in Switzerland, in the Lohenschel Valley in, in Switzerland, three sides of the valley, high mountains, only accessed by a very difficult road which was blocked during winter. So mostly these people didn't have access to the outside world. The rate of dental caries or dental decay was 0 0.3. That's practically zero. Um, total absence of TB, where TB was rampant in Europe at the time, um, had beautifully formed wider, wider jaws and beautifully formed arches, the dental arch, the upper palate, we would say. Um, and discovered that these people are extraordinarily healthy, but eating a very, very restricted diet. They were living basically on rye and milk and cheese. They had cows and they had goats and they had a few sheep. And that's basically what they were living on. Um, very restricted, all of these communities. The, the trouble with the book is it goes from a community to community to community and it repeats the same story. But it's worth reading because it validates, it's a bit like Coca-Cola telling, telling you things go better with Coke. The first time you hear it, you say that's a load of nonsense. But 
if it's, to, if it's told to you a hundred times, you start to believe it. And that's what he was doing in the book. He was reinforcing and reinforcing and reinforcing <coughs> white sugar, white flour, bad news. Um, because of these scandals, with taking fat out of the diet, with adding high fructose sugar into the diet, and by allowing sweeteners, there's a number of sweeteners in the food chain, you start to lose your faith. You start to lose your faith in the food safety authorities. You start to lose your faith in the authorities in general, and in particularly the advisors, because all of the advisors, there was a professor from the University of Liverpool who got up and walked out of a, a nutritional advisory committee, simply because chairing the committee and a number of the representatives on the committee were food companies. And any meeting, any place in the world, doesn't matter where, if there's a nutritional meeting, it's going to be controlled by the food companies. And he got up in protest because he was fed up. And he came out of the room and he said, basically, the fox is in charge of the hen house here. <laughs> and Professor James, that I'm going to talk about in a moment, Professor James was uh, head of the International Obesity Task Force. Professor James wrote a report, Tessa Jowell, when she was Minister for Health in the UK, asked him to tell her what was causing the obesity crisis. So he wrote a long report and it basically pointed the finger at sugar. She quickly shelved it and it was never spoken about. Six years later he was asked by the WHO to write a report and he wrote pretty much the same report. Again it got shelved. Well it didn't actually get shelved. I'll tell you what happened with the WHO. The WHO wanted to advise people to s cut sugar out of the diet as much as they possibly could. They were acting in the best interest of humanity. The CEOs of Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, blah, 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 and so on in the United States rang one of the, the Secretary for Health in the US administration under George Bush and said, get on a plane to Geneva and stop this agenda, please. And immediately it was taken off the agenda because they threatened to pull the money that was paying the WHO. It's always about money at the end of the day. Now that's a scandal. That's a, that's, that's a crime against humanity. That's how I would classify that. And this is, what's going on in the Western world today is a crime against humanity. Because if in the year 2050, half of us are going to be obese and the other half are going to be overweight, that's the prediction. And Professor James predicts that that's going to happen actually sooner than 2050. Then we're all going to be ill. We're all going to have fatty livers. We're all going to be in difficulty. <coughs> we're all going to have type 2 diabetes. We're all going to have heart disease. Where are we going? We're going edge, close and closer to the edge of a cliff and we're going to fall off it. Because people are not allowed to speak the truth. The nutritional advisor to the, U, to the British government at the moment is a man called Professor MacDonald of the University of Nottingham. He's admittedly op openly that he has a conflict of interest. Mars give him a huge honorarium, whatever an honorarium is, it basically means lots of money um, to do what he wants with, to do research with. And he's advising the British government what to do. Now if I I think I should move over to the dark side because there seems to be more money on the dark side. <laughs> Maybe I can get paid billions to work for the sugar industry or whatever. That was just a joke, by the way. <laughs> um, but all of these advisors to governments around the world, they're all being sponsored by food companies. The British Nutrition Foundation. The British Nutrition Foundation is supposed to look at evidence-based research and supposed to issue objective statements. The head of the British Nutrition Foundation was a former CEO of Tate and Lyle, which is a sugar company. That's scandalous. I mean, who's, not only is the fox in charge of the hen house, Dracula's in charge of the blood bank, and it's all <laughs> over the place. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, not, it's not funny, it's actually sad at this stage. Um, I've also started to lose re re faith in medical research. Although I quote medical research, I'm careful about what I quote. 
because there's a huge scandal in the United States at the moment where there's a Senate committee investigating a number of doctors who don't just have a conflict of interest, have a very serious conflict of interest, where they have used children as guinea pigs, basically, to do clinical trials on drugs that haven't been approved. And two of them are Dr. Beardman, a professor of psychiatry in Harvard Medical School, and eminent, eminent doctor. Why he needs to do this to discredit himself, I really don't know. He received $1.6 million from pharmaceutical companies. And this man, uh, Schatzberg, is at Stanford Medical School, again a professor of psychiatry, again worked for the government, worked for the NIH, the National Institutes for Health. Again, he's been accused. He, he, he has $6 million worth of shares in a pharmaceutical company called Concept Therapeutics. I'll get lynched if the guys next door hear me speaking, but it's public knowledge, this. If you go on the internet, you'll find it. And there's a, an article that appeared in, the, in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2008. That's the reference there, volume 300. Um, Industry-sponsored medical research, a broken system. It's, it's destroying the medical profession, basically. And that marriage between Western medicine and pharmaceutical companies is a bit like where the banking scandal is going. It's discrediting another institution in our society. The Catholic Church has been discredited. The bankers have been discredited. Politicians have been discredited. Now the medical, the, uh, some of the top medical people in the world are being discredited. And the structures in your society are collapsing. They're failing. And this is where you have to take control and you have to empower yourself. Um, because if you don't buy Coca-Cola Zero, nobody in this room and nobody in this city buys Coca-Cola Zero, certainly <coughs> Coca-Cola, the shares in Coca-Cola are going to drop and big investors are going to shift their money somewhere else. 66% 60 60, of medical schools in the United States have shares in pharmaceutical companies. That's crazy. Like when I did medicine, the only modality of treatment that I got taught was drugs. <coughs> Nobody ever mentioned nutrition. Nobody ever mentioned a probiotic. I did microbiology and then did medicine. Spent almost 10 years in university. You would think I would have heard the word probiotic. No, never heard the word probiotic. I dealt with bad bacteria. We never heard about the good fellows. They didn't exist. Um, yeah, something has to change. The food pyramid. At the bottom of the food pyramid, there's two basic statements. There's, there's actually three basic statements that are incorrect in the food pyramid. And that's why in the book, I've turned the food pyramid upside down. Um, the primitive people that Dr. Price visited. I worked in Africa and spend time with the Fulani in West Africa, who are nomadic people like the Maasai. I spend time with the Maasai in East Africa. And there are other primitive people, like the Inuit, the Eskimos, and the Sami people in northern Scandinavia. It's too cold up in northern Canada and northern Finland to grow cereals. It's too cold to have fruit and veg. They eat reindeer. They live on caribou and moose and reindeer. Fat and protein is what they eat. And they're the two basic new requirements for the physical body. If you want to survive and be happy for the rest of your life, gobble, 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 lots of fat and lots of protein. Because that's the core of your body. And I'll come back to that in a moment. You can live quite happily without cereals, as these people have, have proven. So to tell people to eat more cereals and eat more starch is ludicrous in the face of an epidemic. You should be telling people to eat less and less starch and particularly avoiding gluten. And reducing animal fat, there is simply no basis for reducing animal fat. It's been proven scientifically that animal fat does not cause heart disease in 2014. We can make that statement definitively. Your common sense would have told you that anyhow. 
my mother knew what created uh, heart disease and fat and so on. Um, but if, if, we ha if we have reduced fat, which we have in the diet, heart disease would be close to zero at this point. Heart disease is pretty much unchanged. Deaths from heart disease have improved, but that's got to do with medical care. That hasn't got to do with diet. And just I'm reinforcing that point again, that stay away from wheat, from modern wheat. Um, it has the potential, in combination with sugar, it has the potential to increase weight that's very hard to shift. 